Okay, in this topic, we're going to be getting up uh, into how to apply cryptography within your CISSP and understanding how that works in relation to the different life cycles and so forth. So in this group, what the objectives is going to be cryptographic life cycles, key management, algorithm selection, and so forth, cryptographic methods, symmetric, symmetric, <laughs> asymmetric, elliptic curve, public key infrastructure, key management practices, digital signatures, integrity, understanding methods of crypto, crypto analytical, yeah, that, that big, that big word there, attack, and digital rights management. All right, in this objective, we're going to talk about cryptographic life cycle, and that's key management algorithm selection, our examples. So when you're dealing with cryptography, there's a lifespan that goes into this, and everything but the one-time pad, which is basically a one-time uh, password, uh, password is not the right word, but a one-time crypto key, uh, is, is susceptible to crypto lifespan. And what that basically comes down to is Moore's Law is basically pushing it in this direction where a processing power doubles every 18 to 24 months. And that is so true. And we're seeing that more and more now. And in the past, when we were running hash tables against, or rainbow tables against passwords, one of the aspects that we would get into is how do you crack passwords? And based on the crypto that was in place for passwords, it was based on AES 128-bit, it would take forever to, to crack it from the standpoint of a really complex password. Now, as you're dealing with uh, uh, non-complex passwords, it tries different iterations to, pa to break through that. Now, as we're dealing with cryptography and you get the different base uh, bits that are involved with AES-256, now that is the next standard that's come out, um, it, what's happening is, is the processing power to roll through all the computations and all the permutations is increasing dramatically. And so since that, that increase in uh, computing power, What's happening is, is that people are quite concerned about cryptography and how long will the crypto be able to maintain its edge on protecting your information, especially as we're getting into quantum computing. And I've, I've noticed that some of the things that are out there right now, there's uh, Google is doing the quantum project where they are asking companies to be part of a consortium to work through quantum computing. Well, people are worried about that if these quantum computing is thrown out is is crushing as far as the the amount of computations it can run per second they are worried that it basic crypto will be supplanted and be become existent a non-existent it'll it will be not useful i i beg to struggle with that in the fact that people are resourceful and when they come up with quantum computing and that will crack the current aes 256 because it's so fast um, that's, they'll come up with something else. They'll come up with AES 10,362. I mean, I'm, I'm just joking about that. But the bottom line is that people will be resourceful and come up with different options. When you're selecting crypto, you need to understand what is your data that you're trying to protect. Uh, and that will specify the current and up-to-date crypto algorithms that you may use. So you got AES, you got triple DES, and you have RSA. Each of those have our different algorithms that are available to protect your cryptography or your, your data. Now the question is, is you have to determine which is the best to use within your environment. Uh, is it AES, is it triple DES, or is it RSA? And you need to identify key links for your organization. What are the keys that you want to have and how long are you willing to have those? You basically lengthwise, how many bits? And you need to determine what is the best option for your organization. The other thing you need to understand is how are the, what are your best secure transmission protocols? How are you gonna do this through SSL? Uh, what, what is your path forward and what type of algorithm do you want to use to secure your transmissions within your organizations? So the CISSP, it's important for you to kind of get that. And what it comes down to is, do you need to know the cryptography and how it's, it completely works? I'll tell you right now, I don't know that. Um, I, I, I have a tacit knowledge of it and I understand the concepts and I understand how it works and I understand the differences between them. But getting into the really deep nuts and bolts of that, this comes down to the one inch deep and a mile wide aspect of it. The cool part about being a CISSP is that you get to expand all these different, get to touch all these different areas. And so therefore, I, I deal with all of these algorithms, AES, Triple DES, and RSA on a weekly basis. So it's something you need to be conversant on. And you have to be able to, as you're talking to leaders within your uh, organization, especially if you're a CISO, how do you explain that information to them in a way that they can understand it? 
The key thing you need to think about your keys is don't set it and forget it. You need to know where your keys are stored. Um, and in many cases, we've seen it where people will forget that. And then they get in a situation and they go, well, where are the keys stored? I don't know. What do we do now? Then you're in a really tough spot. Uh, if you have access to the system, you have to rekey it. Well, if you get rekeying it, now are those keys built into applications throughout your environment? So you have to understand where they're stored and what, how are they best protected? Talked about crypto today will be outdated in years. And there's no question in my mind that it will be. But new technology will come out and there'll be new ways to, to protect the data and provide some level of Im immunity and Im uh, knowledge around the actual data itself. So, again, you need to make sure that you have the newest technology, especially as the algorithms roll into your organization, uh, because, again, it will it will come and it will go uh, like Blowfish was a standard for many years. And now that's been outdated. Right. So once it gets cracked, how do they deal with it? Uh, it's an ongoing process and it really confuses most people. And in some cases, it even confu I get, it confuses me. So I know that if it confuses me with my third grade education, it confuses other other people. Um, there are security people out there and there's PhDs and master's guys that have got all this down pat and they get it. And you know what? Those are the kind of people, if you're looking to implement, incorporate a very successful and large uh, deployment within crypto within your organization, those are the people you need to find. Uh, but again, it it's, can be very confusing and challenging. So therefore, it's always good to stay updated on the newest and latest trends as it relates to crypto. So what are some cryptographic methods that we're going to be working through? Well, you have the symmetric, asymmetric, and elliptic curves are the key ones that are out there being used. Um, and we talked about modern crypto is com computationally complex, and in, that is actually an understatement as what it can do. But it does relate to the CIA triangle for confidentiality integrity and availability, especially in confidentiality and integrity of the crypto will help keep it confidential, your data. And then from an integrity standpoint, it ensures that your data has remains, it, it hasn't been compromised and it's the integrity of the data is, is consistent. So there's three types of algorithms potentially, particularly used. There's symmetrics, asymmetric, and hashing algorithms. And we'll get into each of those here in just a minute. So as you're dealing with cryptographic keys, you need to rely on the secrecy of at least one key. And that we'll talk about will be your private key. And that at least one of the keys has to be secret so that nobody else knows it. Uh, otherwise, you really are just kind of sharing stuff around. That's about the extent of it. Uh, the key, la key length is also a very important aspect because the computational, computational permutations, see, now my third grade education just went beyond me, um, will determine how the longer it is, the more computational aspects have to run. It basically has to run longer. Uh, and so key length is an important equation, part of this equation. Uh, an example of this would be DES, not triple DES, but DES, which is data encryption standard. Uh, the key length of that was 56 bits. Well, that's crackable, especially in today's computational capabilities. It was totally crackable. Um, and then that's why these the different aspects keep happening. It keeps getting longer and longer key bit pairs. Uh, and now I think we're up to 1024 is what they're they're utilizing. So the whole point of it is, is that the longer the key, the, the better off your chances are of it from being cracked. Symmetric al key algorithm. Now, this is a shared secret. Now, both parties must have a copy of the shared secret. So that would be in this case here, the sender encrypts the data. There's a receiver decrypts the data. So you've got to have a copy of what that shared secret is. And it's really good for bulk encryption. So if you're going to encrypt a whole bunch of stuff and you then ship it across the wire to something else, having the encryption key on the other end is very, very useful. Uh, so it, that's where the symmetric key comes into play for. Now, the weaknesses around this are is that it's key distribution. You need to have a way to secure your keys and get them to other people. You don't want to put your keys in an email and ship them across the wire unless you do something to that email to best protect it. Uh, you also, if you key, store your keys in a key storage location within the cloud, how do you protect those keys in a way that is keeping them safe? Do, and they also need it does, does not implement for non-repudiation. So when you're sharing keys, the, the non-repudiation piece of it, again, beyond the third grade education that I have, um, is the fact that if you've got to be able to prove that it is you. So that is where the non-repudiation key piece comes to. Uh, blockchain is a good example of it. it provides an immutable, non-repudiated, see, I'm using these big words, these 10 dollar words, and I can't understand what I'm saying. 
Um, the, the, basically, it's a way that you can prove that the guy used is the person who logged into the block. Same thing with the symmetric key. You have to be able to wait a way to prove that that's the person who is sharing the keys. So if you don't know, if you're just sharing keys amongst every all your friends, there's no way to really truly understand did somebody else get a copy of those keys unless you put in a, some other mechanism to prove that. And it's again, sharing keys, it can be lost on who is involved really easily. And the point of it is, is it's not tied to a specific individual. So if I share my keys with Fred and Fred decides to share them with Gina, well, how does that affect me? That can affect me dramatically, uh, especially if I didn't know that Fred shared them with Gina. Uh, the algorithm is not scalable. So basically sharing this with large groups doesn't work well. Now there's other groups, we'll talk about it in a minute, other algorithms that do work well for this, but this is basically block encryption is what you're looking to do. Uh, the, the keys must be regenerated and reconstituted often. And they, the, the, that's kind of the basis of it since it is a block kind of cipher setup or a block distribution. And then at the end of it, all keys must be discarded because you have to assume that the keys have been compromised. So then you have to generate new keys and therefore the old keys must be discarded. And a process that needs to be in place to ensure that the old keys are not used. Asymmetric key algorithms. Now, this is a process known as public key algorithm. So PKI, or public key algorithm, which is part of the PKI or public key infrastructure. This is the solution to symmetric keys. And the fact that what it happens is the sender encrypts the receiver's public key. So there's a public key and a private key. And what will end up happening is if I'm sending it to Gina and Gina is the receiver of it, I have Gina's public key. So what I do is I encrypt my data with the receiver's public key. Now, each person has a private key. So Gina and Fred each have their own private key. And you do not want to share your private key with anybody else. You only want to be able to share. The only thing that's shared to the world is your public key, hence the term public. So what you do is you send your encrypted file uh, with the receiver's public key. They then send it to them. The receiver then decrypts it with their private key. Once it's encrypted, the, the sender cannot decrypt the message she encrypted. So what basically what ends up happening is once you use the person's uh, key, so I go out, I'm going to go and use my key, or I'm not going to use my key, I'm going to use the receiver's public key. Okay, so again, this is where it gets confusing, got public and private. He then encrypt it with their private key, or with their public key. You now ship it to the receiver, and then they're able to decrypt it with their private key. However, once I encrypt it with the receiver's public key, I cannot decrypt the message that I just encrypted. Can't do it, okay? So now you flip it back on the other side and you want to return that message back to me. The receiver then grabs my public key and encrypts the information and ships it back to me. What do I do? Well, now I use my private key, which is known only to me, and I decrypt the information as well. So again, there's a lot of back and forth, but you ensure that it is, I have, as long as I keep my private key, now I can confirm that from a non-repudiation standpoint, I know that I did it, or at least my account did it. Uh, versus if it's a shared key out there for the world to use. All right, I hope that's as clear as mud. <laughs> Just hang in there. Good idea on that one is to, to get some more background around it, uh, study it up a little bit more. But again, the, you need to know the basics and how this all works. Not the gruesome, gory details, but how does it potentially work? Now, again, I recommend as you are becoming a security person in the future and you're growing your skills, yes, it's good to know this knowledge greater more and more. Okay, digital signatures. You need to ensure with your digital signatures, this ensures non-repudiation. It, what it does is it creates a message digest, which is commonly known as an MD. Not like a medical doctor, but a message digest. And it uses a hashing algorithm that basically is to prove that you are who you say you are. And it's a, it's a lighter form of, of encryption is really what it comes down to. But you basically, you encrypt it with the sender's private key. So I grab my private key. I now encrypt it. So I'm going to dig digitally sign a, a email. I encrypt it with my private key, the email itself. I then ship it to Billy Bob, and Billy Bob then decrypts it with their with my public key that's out there available to the world. And it's, again, it's to prove that I sent them that email. Now, digital signatures. What we did in the, in the previous hacking days was what we would do is we would then so make the people think that they're actually getting a digitally signed email. We would actually copy the um, the little logo saying it's digitally signed, and we would paste that into the email. And so, therefore, they would think it's a phishing attempt. They would that it was digitally signed. However, it wasn't digitally signed. 
There's ways that you can check that, but in reality goes is that was a, a social engineering spoofing way that we would get people to go think, oh, it's digitally signed. So again, it's only as good as your employees. So if your employees don't do the, the run the traps on this, they can get themselves into some trouble. Okay, so the strengths of this, it's a one is one public and private key pair. Okay, so anybody who kick starts up, they're going to have their own public and private key pair. The public key will be available to the world. The private will not. And again, this same key pair is used with, to communicate with all users. And, then, and so any new person comes up, they're not using a shared key pair. They're using a private and public key pair. It's very easy to remove this, right? So you can revoke these keys as necessary, especially if you're running this through an overall infrastructure with using PKI, uh, public key infrastructure. Key revocation is very simple and can be done quite quickly. And it, it allows for an offboarding process of somebody leaving your organization to fix it real quick. Now, key regeneration, your private key only, only private keys can be regenerated. And, and therefore, you don't want to lose that private key. Because the thing is, let's say you have a private key, you encrypted all your, all your poo and everything's cool and life is good. And then for whatever reason, your account gets compromised and your private key is compromised. You have to regenerate a new private key. Well, all of the information that you encrypted with your private key prior to that, prior to losing it, is lost. You can't get it back. Once you revoke that private key, you're done. You can't get any. So there's an aspect of you may want to, if you have that private key before it's totally revoked, unencrypt all of that data and then re-encrypt it with your new private key. So again, that's, that's something to consideration with that. Simple key distribution. Participants just make public keys available. So it's, it's real simple, right? You have it out there in the cloud. The public key is available to everybody. So it's really key from a distribution standpoint. And also the fact that your private key is held within your system completely. It's held within you. You have it, right? Um, it, the other thing is, is with asymmetric key algorithms is the fact that it's a very simple communication. You don't have to communicate with everybody going, hey, guys, here's the key to unlock the stuff. Um, it, it's all based on your public key is out there already. You can communicate with anybody and because your private key is not shared. So it's, it's really good with people that you do not have a pre-existing relationship with. Okay, as so we're dealing with elliptic curve, we're talking about the elliptic curve algorithm. And this is another one of the key pieces around uh, in cryptog cryptography. So one of the key points around this is it's an approach to public key crypto. Uh, they use elliptic curves and, and they basically deal with it from an algebraic, algebraic, I can't even say that, yeah, algebra structure of the elliptic curves. Um, the key part about this is it's really implemented a lot in digital signatures and pseudo random no, uh, generators. And a pseudo random generator will basically create a uh, random number based on and they, they incorporate these pseudo random generators and these numbers into the crypto. And that's a big benefit when you're dealing with elliptical curve the benefits of it it's it's got a very small key size so it's much smaller in that respect but it's equal to the larger rsa type so you're dealing with the the high key pairs of 256 bit or whatever the the rsa is much larger than the elliptic curve so as an example a 256 bit elliptic curve is comparable to a 3072 bit rsa public key so Again, elliptic curve has been very positive. Uh, they've used it a lot, and uh, it's basically been with the NSA. They did they use it quite a bit as it relates to uh, the different keys that are available. Um, and that one of the things that I saw as a note that NSA is addressing the crypto issue due to the quantum computing capability, because again, many people are concerned uh, around this. And when you're dealing with companies or with agencies such as the national security agency our administration um or it's agency national security agency uh there is some big factors that roll into crypto and how important it is that they have a good understanding of what they're trying to accomplish here in the future so now we're dealing with pki which is basically called public key infrastructure um the purchase the purpose of this is to allow you to communicate between various parties uh, so, for example, you want to send information to uh, somebody in Russia and utilizing PKI, it allows it to be a really good trust relationship between these parties because everybody's agreeing to that standard, that infrastructure. Uh, it, util it utilizes symmetric and asymmetric hashing and digital signatures. So it uses all of them. And it's the overall piece that 
you see a lot within digital signatures and I know like within Outlook you can actually incorporate PKI but now PKI from what I understand is actually going away and in the case of uh, Microsoft they have incorporated that into their Office 365 platform so there really isn't a traditional PKI as you know it so this even this as well is changing um, over time and you can expect to see more changes in the future with it now it deals with certificates and these digital certificates are they basically they're not the encryption piece of this so a certificate doesn't really do anything other than to provide you assurance that the person on the other end is who they say they are it's the correct person or party um, and they talk these by that x509 certificate now these certificates are created with uh, a hashing algorithm and so therefore there's crypto involved with them but what they are is they just prove that you are who you say you are and the certificates though is a key piece when you're dealing with PKI so as you're dealing with the PKI aspect of this, you have certificate authorities. And these authorities are what hold PKI together. They're what make the glue that holds all these pieces together. Now these, these certificate authorities, if you go into your, your settings on your browser, there's various certificate authorities that are quote unquote trusted. So if a, if a certificate authority, um, let's just say DigiCert, was to provide you a certificate saying that yes, Sean Gerber is who Sean Gerber says he is, and he's gone through the wickets to prove that, um, and that SSL certificate says, yes, I am who I am. So therefore, now I should be trusted. Now, there's various levels of uh, certificates that you would get into. But bottom line is, is that the CA will issue you that specific certificate. And there's Semantic, GoDaddy, DigiCert. There's various other ones that are out there. I mean, there's actually a huge, it's a plethora of companies that will provide you the CA capability that are considered, quote unquote, trusted. There was a time a while back, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, probably about four or five, maybe even six years ago, that the Hong Kong Post Office was considered a certificate authority, which was really added a lot of interesting dynamic to the whole CA aspects of this. But the registration authorities help CAs determine who these user identities are. So what that means is your registration authority, so like, for example, GoDaddy, now they're also a CA, but they work with the various other CAs to determine users' identities. So if you're going to register for a website, you have to register who you are. You have to try to get a CA, and then they work with them to get that. You pay some money, they ver do some verification aspects of it, and then at that point, they call you good. Uh, but again, it's to basically avoid, there is some accountability and assurance of who you say you are. So if your website, for example, you have a certificate in place of you say who you are, and you've proven it, and now your website is actually attacking somebody else, there is a paper trail or there's a ability to come back to find out what exactly is going on. Is it Sean Gerber that's attacking somebody or is it just his site's been taken over? But if there's assurances, you at least know where to start when you're looking for that information. Certificate generation, this is done through identity, ver identity verification, which kind of talked about a little bit ago. And it provides the, the CA with a public key. So when you get this, your, create, your certificate is created with a public key. And they basically, the CA will digitally sign the certificate with their private key saying, yes, I agree with this person, you know, that this person's been, identity has been verified. And so therefore, this X509 certificate will be created and that will be part of, of you, right? That's how you will say, yes, I am Sean Gerber. I am, I'm with my company XYZ. And therefore, that certificate is valid. Now, certificate revocation. So you get the certificate in place. You've, you've proven who you are. You say, I am good, but there are certificates. You, now you do something bad or you don't pay your bill or whatever, and they want to rev revoke your, your certificate. They have what they call certificate revocation lists. And these are maintained by the certificate authorities. And the browser that you have will point to this and it will look for the CRL to see if your, the certificate should be removed. And then therefore, is it a trusted or untrusted uh, certificate? And that, so therefore, there is some automation based on this. Now, does it always catch everything? No. Is there a delay? Yes. Uh, so sometimes you can still, the site may look like it's got a valid certificate and it's good, but yet it may be on the re revocation list. So I know they've been working to speed that up, but in the past, it has been where 
it wasn't as easy as just you flip a switch and you're on the CRL uh, and then your sites, the, the certificates revoked. So uh, there's an online certificate status protocol, OCSP, and that gives you real time certificate verification. And the purpose of that is based on what I talked about with the CRLs that are in the browser, uh, that there is some delay in many cases. It could be up to days before that that actually goes through. So this real-time certificate verification through OCSP is very valuable. Key management practices. Okay, so as we're getting into this topic and this objective, uh, enc encryption key management is really in a, a, a backbone of how you deal with your encryption within your company. Um, and as a CISSP, it's important that you understand where your, this, the encryption keys are stored. So this is from Tech Target. Encryption key management is the administration of tasks involved with protecting, storing, backing up, that's a key point, and organizing encryption keys. So you need to make sure that you have procedures in place for key management recovery of your keys. So if something bad happens, can you recover those keys? And do you have procedures in place to define how to do it? If you're the only person that knows how to do it, and then you get you win the lottery, not get hit by a bus, how do we know that you're going to be able to, who else can do this for you? So you have to have these procedures in place. You need to have one person who is responsible for the crypto keys, but there has to be a backup in the event that that person is, becomes unavailable. Uh, you also need to ensure that your central repository is secure. Uh, and that depends a lot of cases on where your repository lives. Does your repository live on premises, on your site of your, of your business, or is it in the cloud? Is it in a country that's maybe uh, not real positive about encryption, i.e. China, or is it in a different location that is more uh, open to encryption? So you need to understand where your central repository is located. You also just need to decide if you want two-person control. This kind of works in the ways of the military, where if you are going to get ready to launch a missile, you'd have two people that would launch the missile. So both people turn the keys, push the button, and it's done. So it's kind of on the two-person control aspect. So you need to ask yourself for to get to your crypto keys, do you want that level of protection? Some people do, some people don't. Um, best practice would be yes, that would be great. However, if you're in a dynamic environment that you need to make changes, may potentially quickly and not rely on the two people, then maybe you don't need it. Or if your risk is small, maybe you don't need it. So you got to decide for your business what works best as far as a CISSP is concerned and a security professionals. Amazon AWS, now what they have is they have a key management service, which is their web services KMS. Uh, this is where you store the keys for encryption within Amazon AWS. Understand that you can configure Amazon to store your keys in an unprotected state or in, by default, you can set it up to be protected. I highly recommend that you do it, get them protected because, I mean, it doesn't really cost you anything in, in reality. Setting this KMS up. Uh, and in most cases, I believe by default with Amazon, they already have the keys in place and they're already managed by, by Amazon. However, you can set it up so that you have your own key management system so that you can get your keys yourself. Uh, you, they're set to rotate the keys yearly. That's a good idea. So you should change your keys out at least every year. And then don't allow your keys to be transferred between availability zones. So what it basically means is in Amazon, there's different availability zones in different regions. And you don't want these to be transferred between the two because one, loss of potential of the key. Two is how could it potentially be compromised. So each data that you have in each availability zone should have its own set of keys that are managed by your key management service. All right, object of this objective, we're going to get into digital signatures. We've talked about these a little bit um, in the past, but there's two main goals. And this is to assure the recipient has sent the message, right? So you're assuring that Sean has sent the message to Fred. And then you also to assure the recipient that the message was not altered. Again, so that when it was sent to Fred, it they, Fred can be assured that nobody messed with it. Nobody injected anything into it that wasn't supposed to be there. Those are the two primary goals around digital signatures. Now, the other things you can use it for is for authentication so can the digital signature because it's verifying who you say you are can it be used for authentication it can't i personally have not seen it that way but it can definitely be used that way um, your signature verifies a valid code so basically if you are a developer and you have code you can then have a, a digital signature va validating that yes i created this or yes our team created it and it's basically putting a fingerprint or a thumbprint saying yes we agree uh, with what's happening here so again those other uses are for authentication and or validating your potential code within your code repository. 
Now, the one thing to consider about all this is it does not provide for privacy. The digital signature does not do that at all. It only provides for integrity, non-repudiation, and authentication are met. So all it's doing is saying, yeah, it's good, but it's not protecting your data like you would assume or assume an encryption would. So it's just saying you agree, it, you are who you are. It did not get messed with and potentially could authenticate. Yet, yeah, Sean is Sean. He said that. However, it does not encrypt any of your data and protect your data. So don't think about it as a, a privacy tool. All it is is verifying who you say you are and that the, the data is true and valid or hasn't been altered with, yes. Because you could put bad stuff in it and it'll still work. But bottom line is, is that it just says that it's, it has not been altered. All right, so we're going to get into integrity around hashing. So hashing is a very, very simple purpose, okay? It's, it's not a complicated piece, but what it's done is it's basically creating a value based on a potentially very long message. And so it, it'll do this with your email messages, whatever it might be. What it creates then is that they call a message digest. So when you, it does this hashing, it creates this message digest about your email. You send it off, okay? So then you send the sender, sends it to the receiver, and the receiver gets it. So then what he does, he or she does, is then they will do the same thing, and they will look at the hashing of that email, and they will ensure that the message digest of what was created is the same as what they pull up okay so what that will tell you that then the integrity of the document has not been changed if you was bad and somebody had messed with it what would end up happening is is the sender would send it and they'd have a message digest of whatever let's just say one two three but when the receiver opened it it said one two three four so what that would tell you is that somebody or something has modified the message uh in route so it's got to be the same when you're dealing with hashing now, there's five basic requirements for crypto hash functions, and this is the RSA security. This is what they've kind of brought up here. It's the input can be any length. So the input that you're putting in, it could be an email that's a gazillion lines long, can be any length. But the output must be fixed. It must be a fixed number that they, they give you as an output. So that way it can be compared to the, the other one. The hash must not be easily to compute for any input. So you basically, got, it's got to be able to be complex enough that you, you just can't put in an input. It comes up with a message digest and you, anybody can come up with that same input. It must be easy to compute for any input. So it, it, ha it can't be complex and overly complex. It's got to be very simple. You put it in and the output gives you the same number. Uh, it is a one-way function. So like we talk about your message digest, if you create a message, you create your message digest, you ship it, the person opens it up, they see what they compare, it, the message digests are compared, the MDs and the MDs are comparing, and it says, good, great, awesome. You now, as the receiver, turn around and want to send a message back to the, to the sender, you will create the whole process, but backwards. So you'd never actually append the message digest. It's always a new message digest. Okay, so that's, that's the whole purpose of it. And that the goal of it is, is that they want to make it so that it's hard to determine the input with the output provided. So you basically you can't reverse engineer it. And the hash is also collision free. So the reason behind that is that when you create this hash and you ship it, it's not going to collide with anything else that's coming back and forth. Now, there's some common hashing algorithms that you've probably heard about. The first one is SHA, the SHA. SHA-1, 2, and 3. Okay, those are very popular al hashing algorithms that you'll see out there in the market today. Also, Message Digest, there's MD2 and MD5 hashes. Now, the MD2 is, pro is proved that the MD2 is, an, is not a one-way function. So what they found out is that it could be used, you could turn around, re-engineer it, and ship it back, and it would cause a spoofing capability. So it should not be used. The Message Digest 5, though, and they said is subject to collisions, which shouldn't be used for an, as an integrity aspect because you can't prove that the document is what it says it's supposed to be because of the, uh, the collisions that are involved. So bottom line is your SHA-1, 2, and 3 are the ones you should be using when you're looking at hashing uh, for your messages. All right, so the next objective is we're going to talk about various attacks. The analytic attack is an algebraic attempt to reduce the complexity of the algorithm. So the whole point of it is, is that it's it's trying to make the algorithm instead of as complex, that's what you want, right? You want the algorithm to be complex enough that it, it cannot be cracked. So if it's cracked, then what people can, they can reverse engineer it and they can get access into the encryption and they can decrypt what they need to. The implementation attacks are attacks on weaknesses of the crypto system itself. So if for some reason that they're the implementation of uh, the application, so they're incorporating the crypto into 
the code, but they do a poor job of, of not doing it correctly, basically don't do it correctly. Well, what then can happen is the implementation of that crypto within that application is flawed. So then the attackers will utilize that flaw and try to take advantage of it. Statistical attacks is they focus on statistical errors within the crypto. And this happens a lot when people kind of come up with their own, and all these attacks in reality come up a lot with people who come up with their own crypto for their applications. They're solid crypto out there right now that should be used and the biggest issue comes into is when people think they have a great bright idea and they want to come up with their own version of it all of these attacks can hit you because the reason those other ones have been so successful is because they've been around for a while and the holes have been punched into them dramatically so that's why it's important to stick with known crypto and not come up with your own but the statistical attacks focus on statistical errors that you will find within crypto. And ideally is that your statistical errors are much less, especially on crypto that you're using now, that that's been in the market forever. Brute force attacks are when they use rainbow tables, where this is, we, we got some rainbow tables in a, a previous life from the Russians. And what we would do is try to run those tables against password hashes and we just we'd have daisy chain multiple computers together to go over these over and over and over and over trying to find passwords now today's world that's very hard um it, it's it, you, I mean, you can do cloud computing do the same thing but there's other ways that you can steal these passwords rather than using rainbow tables uh pass the hash is something that where you can just copy the hash of the password and utilize it as long as the session's engaged um that's a great way of doing it as well but a bottom line is is there's many ways to attack uh, these environments and if, especially if you're dealing with crypto focus on the stuff that is well used and well known do not make your own and do not find stuff that is the next best thing to uh to to aes 256 right that just don't do it just don't do it so there's many many more though that the attacks that you can look at from a crypto yeah that word <laughs> attacks Digital rights management. What this does is it utilizes encryption for copyright protection. So like in the case of CDs, DVDs, there's DRM that's put in place on these to protect the, the, the rights of the individual who's created the content, right? We don't want the people just to steal it, so they put this in place to, to slow people down. Can people rip this off? Yes, but there's privacy laws and there's, there's laws in place that will stop or at least hopefully deter people from doing that because bootleg uh, software and uh, pirated software right now is is huge it's a big deal and that's why these drm protections are in place now in the case of sony in that one bullet they talk about drm as an intrusive manner they actually use drm as a almost like malware within the cd and it actually ended up sucking back data to the main site or to Sony. Uh, there was actually a big old stink about this where Sony was taking individuals information and utilizing the, the DRM in it for other purposes than to protect the software itself or the videos. Now, some DRM options, again, we talk about music and what what will happen is, is they have subscriptions in place, which is really cool, like Pandora or whoever else um, you can utilize the the software until the end of the subscription so once the subscription ends so say you have it monthly and you decide to terminate it with Pandora or any of these music listening Amazon music whatever once that subscription ends and if you have that music on your system DRM will then go will be enacted so you can't utilize the software so that's a great thing around the music Movies, there's significant piracy issues. We kind of talked about this briefly. Um, most of the protections on movies have been negated. There's ways around it. Um, and so now I, I, they might be coming up with more software, but I've seen the stuff that's been around for a while that can be hacked, can be cracked pretty quickly. However, the good thing is, is there's, you, you first you open up a video, you see piracy, you're going to jail, right? So the point of it, there's huge fines for having pirated software, especially if the if you turn around with the software and try to sell it and make profit off of it. Um, you know, so there's, I mean, all of it, no matter what, it's bad, right? Whether you do it for personal use or you try to sell it, there are laws in place that it will cost you a huge amount of money to do that. However, especially when people are selling it, that's when it even becomes a bigger issue because now uh, you, you highlight yourself in that space. So piracy is bad, shouldn't do it, period, dot. Um, and the fact is, is movies and music, it's all over the place. Ebooks, video games, and documents. Again, there's all kinds of DRM protections in place for those to protect them as well. 
And and it's neat because you can like in the case of I listen to uh, our uh, books on tape, and the neat part about it is is they'll put a subscription. You'll you'll you sign up from the library, downloads to your system, your computer, and as soon as my the expiration is done, I lose access to that system, and then I have to go back to the library to re reestablish the subscription. Uh, it's a great tool. It's an awesome tool to help keep things the way they should be. Bottom line, though, from a security point of view, if there's a way to get around it, people will do it. There's no way you're going to stop it. But you want to have governance or laws and regulations in place to help uh, curb that and put some level of protections around protecting the intellectual property behind it. So, again, DRM, some great options there. Uh, it's I highly recommend it, especially if you've got software that could be pilfered and pirated pretty easily. All right, so this is went over the CISSP again, the book that's through uh, ISC Squared. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there, and uh, we'll move on to the next one.